To present the future of artificial intelligence, please welcome our friend, Adam Chire. Uh, so welcome. What, a, what an honor to kick off an incredible day. Uh, I do have a day job, but when David called me and said, could you come, and he told me about this, this event and the people who were going to be speaking and joining, uh, I knew I had to, I had to take a PTO day and, and come down here. Uh, so just a quick hand for David and his team for putting this together. <laughs> so what I'd like to talk to you about in the next 30 minutes is about artificial intelligence. I know you've probably heard about some of it in the press. You know, you know something's been going on. But I'm going to catch you up with what you need to know in case you've, you've missed it, uh, a few of the details. Uh, I'm going to answer questions both where is AI being used today, maybe in business? Uh, are there things that we have to be afraid of? Uh, and then I'm going to tell you about something that maybe is not uh, a huge part in the press right now, but it's my prediction of what will change everyone's life in this room and beyond in a significant way. And it's not really on the radar at that scale just yet. So let's begin. Uh, so, uh, AI. So, in the last five years, there are things that have happened that I think have, are, are more significant than happened in the decades since I've been working in AI before that. And since it's my story, I get to start with Siri <laughs> kicking it off. Uh, so, in February 2010, not the Apple version, but uh, Siri, the little startup that, that I helped co-found with uh, Tom Gruber and Doug, Doug Kitlaus, launched our first app, and two weeks later, we get a phone call, and it's like, hey, it's Steve, what you doing? <laughs> Want to come over to my house tomorrow? And it's like, Steve, <laughs> the Steve. So in a sense, uh, if you look at the timeline of AI, which we're going to do very quickly, Steve Jobs, who had revolutionized multiple industries, including computing, music, movies, etc. cetera, uh, you could argue that he was the first to really see the coming wave of AI. And his uh, phone call um, and investment in, in Siri back then, there was not a lot of AI on, AI on the landscape, was really, I think, um, looking forward. So February 2010, Siri launched. In 2011, uh, IBM Watson, beat the world's best Jeopardy pro, uh, playing program, I mean, with a program named Watson. And so you could ask questions, and a computer knew more about culture, knew, nor, knew more about facts, and through language was able to best hum humans, the best humans uh, at a game that I think is, is really part of, of who we are as, as humans. So it was a pretty impressive um, uh, event. Uh, October 2011, Apple's Siri launched on the iPhone um, to hundreds of millions of users. In October 2010, uh, a company called Vicarious, a small startup in the Bay Area, uh, claimed that they had beaten kind of a Turing test. So what is a Turing test? Alan Turing, a mathematician, said, well, what if we had AI, how would we know? And posed a question and, and kind of a series of tests uh, that would kind of pit humanity and machines and see if they could compete uh, in an indistinguishable way. So the test that they beat was CAPTCHA. Does anyone here know what CAPTCHAs are? CAPTCHAs are those little kind of annoying pictures on the web that says, prove you're human. We have to keep out all of those web scraping robots. And, and it was said that if one and a half percent of CAPTCHAs could be broken, all e-commerce would, would crumble. Uh, and Vicarious, they didn't publish their solution, but they came out with a program that could solve 80% of the CAPTCHAs on the market today. They didn't release it, probably for, for the good, but it was an impressive fact that a machine had now beaten a test that had been designed explicitly to prove humanity. December 2013, Google buys eight robot companies in six months. Aren't they a search engine? What, what's going on? Uh, December 2013, Her hits, 
hits the movies and really starts to take kind of a popular culture, now we're all starting to think about AI and what would AI be like. Um, in uh, April 2014, Google announces that they've been developing self-driving cars and they've logged 700,000 autonomous miles without any accidents. You know, pretty impressive. Uh, 2014, uh, there was a small team who built a chatbot called Eugene Gustman who actually beat the original proposed um, Turing test. So what Turing said was, well, if we had a teletype, if we wrote back and forth, that's what they had back in the 40s, um, and you were conversing with an entity, and you couldn't tell whether it was human or, mach or machine, then that must be intelligence. That was his proposed famous Turing test. And he said, if you could fool one third of the judges, that would be passing. And, and uh, Eugene Gooseman, a chatbot, managed to f fool 10 out of 30 human judges into thinking that it was actually a human on the other side. Now, it wasn't a very long test, about five minutes, and the chatbot you know, could kind of control the conversation. So it's, it was questionable about how important that is, but the original Turing test was, was passed uh, in June 2014. October, October 2015, um, I was borrowing my wife's Tesla. My son is sitting next to me, and I say, hey, Noah, want to see the most significant technology advance since Siri? And that's, that's a big topic in, in our household. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, yeah, what's that, Dad? And I just reach up and stretch, and I'm like, ah, as we're driving along the road. And he's like, oh, my God, that's insane, because we're coming up to a a curve, and the car just smoothly, autonomously drove around the corner all by itself. And that was an over-the-air update that had arrived the day before in the Tesla. It's not like we bought something different. It just arrived in the car. Pretty, pretty unusual and cool. And then in 2016, DeepMind, a company bought by Google, uh, beat the world's best Go player. And this was a challenge that because of the ex exponential a size of the problem space, people predicted that it would not be beaten for decades, and yet they managed to do this. So those are just a few things that in the last five years are pretty incredible, you should know about. Um, I'm going to give you just a few more. So I've been working in artificial intelligence since the 80s, uh, and there were things that have happened in the last five years that I thought would never happen in my lifetime as an expert in the field. So these maybe I could have predicted. Let me just show you or give you a hint at a few of this. Uh, automated labeling, and this is from Google. I apologize, it's very small, but I'll try to give you a sense. The pictures you're seeing and the captions underneath, the captions were generated automatically by machine. A group of young people playing a game of Frisbee. A herd of elephants walking across a dry grass field. That's incredible. I mean, for me, I thought there's so many possible combinations. How is a machine going to do this? Even when it gets things wrong, two dogs playing in a the grass, there are actually three. Two hockey players are fighting over the puck. Close, slight depth perception error. A close-up of a cat laying on a couch. Even mistakes are pretty darn good. And then let me give you the ones that were, that were basically the worst of the lot. A skateboarder does a trick on a ramp. Pretty close. I love this one. A little girl in a pink hat is blowing bubbles. And you see the purse of her lips. And I'm like, almost. A red motorcycle parked on the side of the road. And, the, and those are really some of the, the mistakes. Uh, here they're actually the worst, worst ones, unrelated to image. A dog is jumping to catch a frisbee. I can see it a little bit. A, refrigera a refrigerator filled with lots of food and drink. And a yellow school bus parked in a parking lot. Got the yellow part right. So this was something that I said, I did not think a machine would be able to perceive the world with all of the knowledge and semantics and be able to not only understand what's in the image, but to then label it and write the prose to describe it. Uh, I and, and many other people in the field were blown away. Uh, let me give you another one. This is a video from uh, Boston Dynamics. We'll play just some of this.
So when I first saw robotics and how the plastic and metal and wires could move and also how it made me feel about them, I was blown away. I mean, just the physicality, there, there's something to be said about it. Now, these are probably not autonomous. I believe they're being remote controlled, but still, it's the movements, the gait. Um, so this in front, the, what looks like a head, is not actually a head, it's actually the hand of the robot, um, as you'll see in, in just a moment. Pretty amazing. Uh, I, I'm blown away. I'm going to let it play just a little longer. Show you one more, one more clip. That's the clip. <laughs> no problem. And off it goes. And so pretty amazing, pretty amazing stuff from Boston Dynamics, also one of the companies that Google had bought. Uh, and then here's one that happened just last summer. Um, there was a human patient with a form of leukemia that had been misdiagnosed by human doctors, and the Watson uh, computer program actually found a correct diagnosis and is attributed with saving a person's life. And that's kind of working together, human and machine, I think that's, a, that's an incredible achievement. Okay, so there's the, the sense of some of the things that have been happening in AI that, that maybe uh, you haven't, haven't seen all of them. Let me talk a little bit about some of the trends. So first of all, code, as a software engineer, really hasn't changed much in the last decades, many decades, until now. It used to be the human's job as a programmer is to tell the machine what to do. And the computer's job is to run the instructions the human told it. But now, um, we're moving to a place, for instance, with machine language, uh, machine learning, sorry, where the human's job is to present the machine with training examples, saying, here's what I sort of want. In this case, I want it to work like this. And in this case, I want it to work like this. And it's actually the machine uh, that writes the program. And one of the things, and we'll illustrate this uh, in a demo a little later, uh, we're now moving to a place where humans and machines will actually write code in a synergistic way. And it's a trend that's happening. Microsoft just recently uh, published a research paper on a program that's starting to optimize uh, human-generated programs and construct programs on their own. And we'll show you more. So software, the, the fundamental way all of our computing works today is starting to change. Uh, a second major trend is that today, AI is extremely good at solving narrow problems, like driving a car or um, beating a person in Go. But it's not very good in a general way. You know, the, the Go playing program can't play chess or checkers or do anything else. It's very narrow. We're starting to move, and we'll see a trend where we're moving to broad AI. What do I mean by that? It's that every company is now going to start to find how can AI be used to optimize um, my business, right? And it's not just the Googles and the Stanfords of the world and and others who can, who can apply AI, it's now moving to everybody. And that's a pretty exciting trend. You'll see more and more of it that if you're a business, if you're not using AI, your competitors may be, you have to be in this game. And the cost and the learning curves and the tools are getting to the point that everyone is starting to, to, to use this. Uh, then we're going to move to something called integrated AI, where rather than lots of these little siloed bits of intelligence, we're going to start to bring them together into a framework that now it might be able to do A and B. Um, 
And then the question is, does that lead us, if we can bring in enough knowledge, enough capabilities into a single system, uh, does that actually take us to real AI, and do we need to be afraid, right? That's a question that's been brought up. So I want to just briefly um, mention that AI is being used in two different ways. One is automation. So there's a, a company named Otto who recently completed the first self-driving truck delivery. Well, that means the human did not need, to, although that trucker did not need to be inside the truck. So there's kind of automation AI replacing humans, and we won't have time to get into that too much today. But there's also augmentation or intelligence amplification where machines are being used to extend humans' capacity to achieve certain tasks. Um, and so one question is, so AI is getting smarter and it's going through these curves. How far will it go and do we need to be afraid? Uh, there's a person named Ray Kurzweil. He now works at Google. He's an esteemed uh, prognosticator and has, makes lots of predictions, and many, something like 80% of them, come true in some form. He has said that by 2029, that's 12 years from now, that the singularity will occur. What is singularity, if you haven't heard the term? It's when computers will become more capable and in, in intelligent than humans. It'll actually be a consciousness that will be on our par or beyond by 12 years from now. That's pretty scary, actually. And others have jumped onto that based on, on this idea that computers are getting faster and by 2029 we'll have more compute power available than the computing that we think goes on in our human brain, you know, maybe intelligence will emerge. And Stephen Hawkins, um, famed physicist, Bill Gates, Elon Musk have come in to say that if AI really goes all the way and becomes human level or superhuman level, this could be a, a really scary, scary thing. Uh, they've now donated um, up to $1 billion to an organization called OpenAI to kind of do research in AI that hopefully will be more transparent and be done in the right way so that bad things won't, won't happen. So there's a lot of fear around this. But there's a different perspective. Uh, actually, I must have taken, I'll take this in a second, which is the, the perspective of every AI researcher I know in the field who actually is working with the software and working with the technology. And if you do a survey of any of us, we will say, this is not going to happen. And the reason is, people are overemphasizing what we can do. Yes, we can do a narrow problem, like drive a car, or, but we have no ability to have software that generalizes. And any two-year-old is going to be more capable. They don't look at 20 billion training examples to learn one simple rule they will be able to learn from a few examples and then apply it in a completely different situation. And that ability to generalize, there's been almost no progress made to date. And so despite the story of we're making incredible progress, it's very, very narrow. It's not able to generalize. And the notion of sentience, which is really what we're afraid of, we don't even have the beginning spark of an idea what that would mean. So I, I'm going to try to just explain this to you, how, how I do uh, to my son or to, to other people. So this is duct tape. So what AI is about is making a simulation of a human. We're trying to make machines like humans. But that's all it is. It's a simulation. And this, with duct tape, you can make a simulation of about anything. If you have enough of this stuff, you could build the Brooklyn Bridge or whatever. So, but it's not real. So imagine I take this tape and I dress myself up. Now it looks a little bit like a tie. It's a simulation of a tie. But it's not real, right? Now, theoretically, it's all made of atoms and a tie and a duct tape, it's the same. Um, but it'll never cross over. In my lifetime, it's not something to worry about. And that's really the, 
the point, which is AI is just a simulation. It'll never be a real tie, so there's nothing to worry about. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I just want to get to the back to business, uh, quickly give you some ideas of where AI is being applied today. Uh, so I started, helped start a company that's called Sentient. We started out actually automating uh, finance. So we built a fund where instead of human traders, you could now have machines that would simulate and evaluate over the history of the stock market, um, different scenarios, and build automated traders as a team that could trade better than, than humans. Uh, and that's been pretty successful. I saw recently Goldman Sachs announced that they had replaced, over the last few years, 600 traders, human traders, with automation um, in various areas. So this is definitely a trend that's coming, that even a high-function um, job like stock trading, AI is now getting pretty good in that specific area. Uh, sepsis, so uh, Sentient has built algorithms to actually learn to predict uh, sepsis, which is the number one killer in emergency rooms. It's sort of arterial blood pressure uh, spike. And when that happens, doctors come running. It's a traumatic and, and potentially fatal situation. Um, they've now using the same data that you're, if you're in an ER hooked up to anyway, they can give doctors a 30-minute window with over 90% accuracy and save lives. Uh, genomics, I'm not going to go through all of these since I'm running a little bit on time. Uh, agriculture, even though for 10,000 years uh, we've been growing food, we really don't know the right optimal combination of soil, moisture, sun, temperature, fertilizer, and all the combinations, and um, Sentient is working with MIT and the Open Ag Project to actually optimize how food is grown in kind of these food cubes as we, we see here, which is completely instrumented and controllable enclosed environment for growing food. Uh, and, and just briefly, the killer app for AI, shoes. All right, I, I, I joke a little bit, but this is a pretty cool application. Um, so here's how it works. If you go to Nordstrom's, this is what they call the shoe whisperer. The, this man, um, I forget his last name, Charles somebody, uh, is he will talk to you, understand the nuances of what you like, what you're looking for, and bring just the right shoes. Now, if you think about shoes, there's huge catalog of them. Um, hundreds of thousands, and yet there's no good way to search for them because it's all about the curve of the arch or the point of the toe or the style of the tassel or the heel. And so what Sentient has done is they can analyze an entire catalog and they play basically a game of 20 questions. And they will say, which shoe that you're thinking of is, is it most like out of all these shoes? They, they analyze all dimensions. They learn attributes that don't have words behind them. You can't describe them. And they say, is it more like these or these? And you go click, 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 click. And each step optimizes, um, as much, gets as much information in that question as possible in the space. And in five clicks, three clicks, you are now looking at the shoe that you were just thinking about. Right, that you couldn't describe, you couldn't browse, you couldn't put keywords in. Uh, so I think this is, has pretty big implications, especially for everything kind of visual that you would buy, handbags, and they're, they're expanding their, their capabilities. So I'm going to close and tell you a little bit about what I've been working on the last few years. Um, and I think it's important. Not a lot of people are cognizant of it yet, but let me make the case. So, Every 10 years, we've noticed, the way people interact with computing changes. So in the mid-80s, we had Windows and mouse and, and keyboard. The desktop PC arrived. 10 years later, 
95, 96, the web browser emerges. And now you have to learn a new style. You click on hyperlinks and you hit back buttons and bookmarks. 10 years later, approximately, mobile, the smartphone, came out and changed computing. Now a lot of people will use smartphones and apps and, and mobile websites for a lot of what they do during the day. And if you haven't been paying attention, we are now 10 years, this 2017 is the 10th year past the smartphone. And people are a little bit tired of apps. I don't know, and anyone here in the last week say, I think I need a new app. Let me go to the app store and browse around. <laughs> Anybody? There used to be magazines to tell you about what the best apps were, et cetera. Um, so everyone is wondering, what is the next paradigm? And we think that it could be the assistant, and we'll tell you why. One comment that for each of the paradigms, there was a dominant winner, right? Microsoft, Google, maybe Amazon also for the web, um, Apple maybe for mobile. Uh, and who that winner is is a big battle that's going on behind the scenes with the Googles, Facebooks, uh, Microsofts, Apple, uh, Samsung, etc. cetera. Um, and so you might ask, why do I need another yet another paradigm, I'm happy with what I've got. It's all about new contexts, because just like the mobile phone let you compute at the bus station, not just on your desk, now there are lots of environments. You're washing dishes in your home, you're driving in your car, you're texting with your friend, you're watching TV, um, you're, you're jogging with your smartwatch, or playing in your virtual reality, augmented reality, heads-up display. In all of these situations, a browser and a smartphone don't work but an assistant who can understand you, execute tasks on your behalf, uh, is the better way. And that's what we're, we're doing uh, here with uh, Viv. So I'm going to, I'll say one last thing and I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna attempt a live demonstration of what we've been working on. Um, so we think, you know, everyone is trying to open up the paradigm, you know, their, their assistant. Siri announced Siri Kit, Alexa has skills, but none of them have done it in a scalable way. And you can look at what they're doing and say, that's not going to turn into a paradigm. It'll be incrementally better than what we have now. But we think in order to take it to the next paradigm, you need four things. A user wants one assistant to deal with, not a thousand. The whole point of an assistant is to make my life simpler and easier. I don't have to remember, what did I tell that one and what did I tell that one? Uh, I want to be able to access that assistant across every device. If I'm driving in my car, I want Viv or my assistant to know me. Um, if I walk into the house, I want to be able to say to the speaker, continue the conversation basically, keep working on that task. So one assistant every device. It needs to scale to every service so that every developer in the world who has a website and a mobile app perhaps can plug in and teach their capabilities, their knowledge uh, um, into, into this assistant. And then finally, the experience should be personalized just for you. It should not be the same assistant for everybody. Um, and that's what we're, we're trying to build. So with that, could we switch over and I'll, I'll try a, a quick demonstration. So as I mentioned, Viv was acquired in October uh, by Samsung. What I'm showing you here is not any Samsung product. Um, it's an internal kind of as our startup uh, test test interface, but it'll give you a feel of the kind of technology that we're working on. Uh, so when you uh, arrive at, at Viv, you'll, you'll have a user profile where you can always see what the assistant knows about you and change your mind. You can also see some of the different types of things that the assistant will do. And through this interface, you can either type, uh, or you can talk, or you can combine the two, uh, or you can tap. And I'll just give you a few uh, uh, examples. So this is too small to see, but I'm typing in, because this is a web interface. Um, so I just, I just typed in, get me a window seat on a one-way non-stop flight from San Francisco to JFK three Thursdays from now. What I want to mention briefly that's different about the behind the scenes is rather than having a human programmer write the code, the sequence of steps, um, Viv has actually constructed this 50 or 60 step program at query time for me, custom, to actually solve this problem that I just asked. And then it'll execute this bit by bit. Um, the last piece that I'll just show here, and then we'll close, 
Uh, so the knowledge about flights and restaurants and all of the things Viv knows is not taught by Viv. It will be taught by the world's developers. And so here you see the, the space of concepts and actions, as we call them, that, that gives you an idea of what uh, Viv knows about. It's really the universe. If you type in something like hotels, you can zoom in and see what is known about hotels and what are the objects and actions, who are the different providers. And so Viv uses this as the raw material to construct programs on the fly by users. And this universe of capabilities will be extendable by any developer in the world. So they can teach for any industry uh, their capabilities, their use cases, uh, et cetera. Okay, so please back to the presentation. Uh, so um, the plan for, for Viv and this, this paradigm, we're not the only ones working on it. Our plan was build it, build the world's best assistant, which you saw a little bit of, distribute it. So we've now been acquired as an independent subsidiary by Samsung. So you could imagine, I'm not making any product announcements, but that Viv technology will start to emerge in the half a billion devices Samsung sells every year. But as independent, we can now open it up after that to any device. Then we'll open up the ecosystem so any developer can add and, and users will have new capabilities, just like the App Store in a sense, and developers will have a new channel uh, to complete their transactions. And finally, we will grow this to every language, every country, every device, and the goal is really to be the, the assistant that any user can get to to access all of the content and services they want to. And so that's it. So my talk, AI is uh, improving, <laughs> assistance coming, and thank you.